So hello everyone. I welcome you to this seminar. We are about to begin. Please keep your microphone and camera off during the presentation. And at the end, there will be a 15 minute session for questions. Now, Professor Albeiro Restrepo from University of Antioquia in Colombia will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Jessica. Um, hello, everyone. It is a real pleasure to host uh, this seminar again. We are really thankful to Gab uh, Gabriel Dos Pasos Gomez to be our speaker um, in this occasion. Gabriel um, did his undergraduate work at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. So um, he graduated there and then moved to Florida State University, where he finished his uh, PhD under the advice of Professor Igor Alabiogin and um, studying relationships between molecular structure and reactivity. And then he joined the group of Professor Alana Spura Busik in uh, University of Toronto for a postdoc in uh, 2019. And um, he's going to start his uh, independent career at uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon University, a very prestigious university which he is proud to show in his, uh, uh, his shirt. It's a very prestigious university. He, he's gonna have some big shoes to fill in there because we all know that uh, John Popel uh, did most of his career at, at CMU. It's a wonderful place. And uh, they host uh, the um, Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. So um, today, um, Gabriel is going to talk us about his work um, at the University of Toronto and uh, navigating through the maze of homogeneous catalysts Design with machine learning. So, Gabriel, thank you very much. We are honored to have you. Okay. Thanks, Alberto, and uh, thanks uh, for the uh, amazing uh, organization for this uh, these events. I I'm super happy to be here today. Um, so, so I'll say, uh, Olá, amigos da América Latina. Estou uh, muito feliz de dar esse seminário hoje aqui para a rede latino-americana de física química teórica. Uh, this is all the Portuguese I'm going to speak today, I think. Uh, I, I must I must start this talk saying that uh, I'm sorry, I lied to you. I, I know that I said that we'll talk about navigating through the maze, blah, blah. blah. You know, one of the, the things that we I even showed you earlier was um, this, well, my presentation is already. It was this uh, image that you, you you may have seen on the call. Uh, this is from a recent paper, and I will talk about it uh, later today. Uh, but I'm sorry, I lied. Actually, we're going to talk about the new project that we are super excited about here in the group. And the correct title for this talk and the paper is a comprehensive discovery platform of organophosphorus ligands for catalysis. And I need to start by thanking all the amazing people involved in this project. Uh, so it's a collaboration between the Sigma Group and University of Utah and the Spuru Guzik Group here at the University of Toronto. Uh, in the Sigma Group, we have Alan Peters and Tobias Gensch now at, uh, Tobias now as a, a PI at TU Berlin. And from the Spuru Guzik Group side, we have Robert Polichia, uh, Shelt Yoner, Akshat Nigan, uh, Telfield Godin, and uh, Michael Lindland Dario, uh, alongside Pascal Friedrich, who now is a PI at KIT. And uh, we also have involvement of uh, AstraZeneca through Shell and IBM through Tel. Um, so I'm super excited to talk about this <clears throat> and many other things. Uh, in Because I, do, I think about chemistry in a few ways. And specifically, I like to think about there are at least two ways of learning chemistry of computers. You can go from a concepts-driven approach, how I explored in my PhD with uh, Igor at Florida State, as exploring stereoelectronic effects and the intrinsic concepts of molecular systems, or you can go through a data-driven approach uh, with machine learning, as I'm doing with Alan uh, Spurgoza in Toronto. But the reality is that this is a loop where you, one, one, uh, one way can fit to the other. And in the end, I think that uh, the overall idea is that well, I want to learn how to control chemical reactivity with computers. And all of this is to say that I, I intend to do this with my team as well at, at CMU going forward, is that we are trying to solve big challenges in, in the field and in the world with the biggest one of them 
something that we all need to be thinking about being climate change and climate catastrophe. Right now, we are on a, on a, a trajectory that is not very good, but given the announcements that the Biden administration had earlier uh, this week on Earth Day, uh, things seem to be moving to a more uh, optimistic path. Let's hope that we all will uh, make the changes that we need to do so. And this all comes with uh, something that uh, bearings this uh, 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 conglomerate in the <clears throat> Wall Street uh, views as a transformational wave in materials uh, research as the three technologies that could create the next trillion dollar markets over the next 10 years. Um, this came out in 2019, and they thought about CRISPR-Cas9 being one of them. Of course, we know that got the Nobel Prize in Chemistry last year, very well deserved. Post-digital computing, what quantum computer falls into, and again, the Scooter Guzzi group is an expert in the field. And finally, material science, which is where I think we are part of and how we can make a difference using a, a few of the things that I'm gonna talk about today. And I'm gonna talk about how, in terms of material science, we I tend to think about catalysis and how catalysis is a very important part uh, of, of chemistry. In fact, if you think about it, catalysis is, uh, as in designed by chemists, is quite unique. You are making things that don't want to react, react. You are forging and breaking difficult bonds, right? Catalysis really is a massive part of the chemical enterprise of all industrial processes. 85% of them are catalyzed. And out of those, uh, about 80% of he are heterogeneous, 17 being homogeneous. We can think about this in terms of the engineering process and so on. But more importantly, by 2050, there is the projected increase in demand of 180% in the from the chemical enterprise. But in order to meet the, the, the overall progress that we need to decrease uh, CO2 emissions, there's a total 30% reduction of absolute CO2 from the chemical industry. A few reminders here is that 25% of all the global uh, energy consumption is used for producing chemicals, and the chemical industry accounts for 7% of all global greenhouse gas emissions. It's a very large part of how we tackle this, right? So what do we need to do? in this case. We need to develop new catalysts for bad industrial processes. That's a good thing. But it's difficult. From conception to the discovery of new catalytic reactions, you can take several months to years. It's a very challenging process. So my question to you and to all of us is, can computational chemistry and machine learning help us accelerate this time of this? Now, I wouldn't be asking you this question if I didn't know part of the answer at least. And I would like to go back and just do a reminder, a refresher of catalysis 101. Say you have a reaction that proceeds from a non-catalyzed path, you pass through a transition state that has an activation energy for it. And you know, in very crude terms, you can think of this as a catalyzed reaction having a smaller, lower uh, activation energy to proceed through the same path. Very uh, crude, but it will serve as well going forward. Now, the question that I brought to you is how to design catalysts and materials with machine learning. And uh, we had a very interesting paper, I believe, a very interesting perspective uh, that Robert Policia, Alana Spurugusak, and I uh, wrote for Trends in Chemistry and was featured on the cover, uh, which is pretty cool, uh, in, back in February this year, where we think about the idea of designing catalysts with machine learning. And this is not a straight path, right? Nowadays, we are in the era of descriptors and uh, data swaps and human experimenters, but we are going forward and going through high throughput experimentation, lab automation, high throughput virtual screening of machine learning, and eventually we're going to get all, all the way to the center of the maze for autonomous discovery. This will demand a modernization of the design, make, test, analyze cycle, where we go from conventional labs uh, to self-driving labs. And of course, uh, you may know that the Oscar Group has been pushing forward on this and many others uh, like the Cronin Group uh, and uh, many others in the field for, for this to happen. A, a, a little thing about high throughput experimentation and analysis, you will see that in terms of catalysis, you need to think about robust catalyst synthesis and 
reaction digitization, parallel experimentation, and many other possible ways of, of doing this in a, in a more uh, robust way. And the group here is actually thinking and doing this. We do have a robot, a chemistry robot that can perform many reactions in parallel. This one is an example of a collaboration we have with Merck on a CAMOS, which is a software uh, developed by the Asperger group to control these machines and perform uh, many machine learning uh, uh, optimizations on the fly with it. Now, all of this comes down to how we are going to think about and do these uh, new designs, right? For the longest time, chemists and scientists in general really have been thinking about this in terms of direct design, where you have a molecule and then you can perform an experiment or you know, or a simulation uh, performing your favorite computational, using your favorite computational tools for that. But I want to tell you about how we're going to go into the future with inverse design. Inverse design, in this case, can be done with high throughput virtual screening or many other techniques like optimization, evolutionary strategies, generative models, and so on. But the overall idea is the following. You tell me the properties you want in your structure, in your catalyst, for example, and I'll give you the structure for it, right? That's the whole the idea of inverse design. And inverse design is very important when you start to think about in terms of chemical reactions. So for a given reaction, all of my uh, experimentalist colleagues, uh, perhaps many of them here in this, in this, in this talk, in this call today, uh, will we'll see that this is true. So for a given reaction, finding the optimal conditions can be challenging. Uh, so if you have A plus B given C, you have a set of conditions. Some of them are continuous, like temperature, time, uh, concentrations, and luckily you can orchestrate those with ChemOS, so let's not worry about those right now. But some of them are discrete. Which acid or base should I use? Which transition metal should I use? Which ligands should I use for my catalyzed reaction? And that's where things start to get pretty complicated. For example, let me tell you about this paper from the Stoltz Group at Caltech in 2019, Science where they are on a road to making natural products with potential anti-cancer drugs. And, and you can see that at some point they say, under these general conditions, we then perform a broad evaluation of more than 60 chiral ligands to achieve at least 80% EE. Think about this. There's a lot of human effort here. These are complex molecules that demand a lot of time and energy and honestly, resources financial resources to be, to be able to make this molecule. It's quite complex. This is not new. Uh, if you go back to something as quote unquote simple as the classic Suzuki coupling where you have a, um, a bromo aerial system and an aboronic uh, acid, here you see that the you need some palladium source, blah, 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 and you have a ligand for that. This is a simple one, triphenophosphine in this paper from 1979 from Yaoru Suzuki. And if you fast forward a few years, you will learn and see in the literature, there are many designer ligands. Here we see that uh, when Marty Burke from UIUC entered the, the game with uh, iterative cross couplings in MIDA, there was a changing in, in the ligand. And then again, just one year later with a slightly different approach, yet another change in ligand using now s And, you know, this, idea of how we can define and figure out what's the best ligand for a reaction might even be hampering uh, the development and, and discovery of somewhat um, pre reactions that you would be surprised that were not discovered until then. Like this one from Mitami uh, it, that came out in Science 2018, where it takes uh, haloarenes, biphenyl haloarenes, and performs an emulative dimerization under a set of conditions that while some of these are a bit unconventional, you can see that the ligand here, and this is the only ligand that this reaction actually performs well, uh, it's not too complex. It's just two of them and tennis and a beautiful group. So what, what gives? Uh, moreover, one thing that we know from this, uh, all of these problems is that optimal conditions are not necessarily transferable. So in the same paper from Itami, they tried to do this reaction similarly for a 
simpler system with one chlor one for chlorotoluene a trimerization, which would be amazing to be able to make three new CC bonds in one pot, being able to make this uh, graphene nanoribbon-like structures uh, with one one uh, one catalytic system, one pot, one reaction. But the best yields they got were twelve percent, and they have uh, this plus an isomer. So it's really it's really complex. You have to uh, try to explore and optimize each re each reaction for the problem at hand, right? Um, the Spurgeon group has been pioneering the idea of inverse design with high throughput sc virtual screening, and they had this uh, this amazing Harvard Clean Energy project in order to find TADF organic emitters. Uh, where you go from library generation all the way to the synthesis and testing of, of, of certain devices. And we covered a little bit in this accounts of chemical research earlier this year. So the idea that I have, that we have here is like, how can we adapt these strategies to the uh, development of homogeneous uh, catalysts? And the way we decided to tackle this in collaboration with the Sigma group is by looking at some of the most ubiquitous ligands in, in homogeneous catalysis, which are phosphenes. So, you know, they not only are commonplace, but also the, uh, as I talked about, the optimizations can be elaborate, is hindering progress, right? Now, phosphorus and phosphenes are great for, for this approach because they have a vast chemical space that can be explored. Many of them are commercially available that you can go and purchase out of your favorite uh, catalog. So we decided to take these ideas and build a comprehensive database of ligands. When we start with these organophosphorus compounds, uh, they are commercially available, the, they are popular ligands, and we have over 1,500 compounds, including many literature entries. In fact, to be precise, 1,558 uh, ligands in this virtual library number one, okay? But we don't want to just work with 1,558 ligands. We want to work with a vast, with the vast chemical space that these molecules and contents, right? And for to in order to do that, we have to build what we call virtual libraries here. The idea of virtual library starts with these 1558 ligands, and we do a fragmentization of those, uh, excluding the systems where phosphorus is inside the cycle, and we get 576 unique site groups. Then out of these unique site groups, we can do combinatorial approaches for them, like uh, say two groups that are the same and one that's different. And that gets us to VL2 with uh, over 300,000 ligands, which really shows a, a vast expansion of the ligands chemical space, but you can go all the way to uh, total combinatorial approach to 191 million possible ligands in this virtual library. So if you were to, to uh, as a, as a a snapshot of how we do this, we start with the 1558 ligands, we fragment the sort of unique substance. For the VL1, we perform many calculations, I'll tell you in a minute. And then we can use machine learning models to, for the descriptors. I'll tell you all about it. So now we have these virtual libraries of what this phosphine, these organophosphorus molecules look like. I said that we have in this VL1, 1558 molecules. At this point, they are described as, you know, smile strings. Uh, but I urge to remind you, molecules are not smile strings. Molecules are not graphs. Molecules are not fingerprints. Molecules are, there are many ways to represent molecules. But one thing that we have to have in mind is that molecules are quantum mechanical three-dimensional objects, right? And what I, I bring this to you to remind you, for example, something that as an organic chemist, we really like to see our Lewis structures like this one ligand here. And if you're feeling fancy, you can really showcase the fact that this is a three-dimensional object with a ball and stick 3D structure model. But the reality is that molecules are quantum mechanical three-dimensional objects that wiggle on it, and they have their own thermal energy for doing this, right? So what is the relationship between molecular conformational energy and reactivity? Well, to cut to the chase, you can think about a molecule sitting on a potential energy surface. And here I'm showing you what would be a given conformer sitting in what looks like a local minimum in this potential energy surface. Uh, like I said, this molecule has energy, so it will be vibrating, rotating, so we have many rumors. Eventually that molecule will have enough energy to go through a transition state, and finally arrive at what is the global minimum on this potential energy surface. 
Because while the molecules are these quantum mechanical three-dimensional objects that wiggle a lot, they're also very much like me. They're lazy. And they like to rest at a point where they're lower in energy. Now, in catalysis, this, is, this plays uh, many roles in terms of the flexibility of your ligand. And you will see that we have to take into consideration many, many uh, points of how uh, these ligands work, right? So the TLDR here is though we must take conformational profiles into account when designing ligands and catalysts. Okay, so going back to this uh, idea of building the comprehensive database of ligands, we have now what conformer ensembles, and I'll show you how we get there, right? So we start with a set of ligands that I told you about, R1 or 2, doesn't matter what it is, but you know, we started with that initial 1558 set. We perform a conformer search engine using uh, semi-empirical methods, and that gives us a ligand conformer uh, ensembles with and without uh, an equal CO3 in order to gather some other information that we need when the, the ligand is complex to a metal system. Uh, this is going back to Harkin, uh, the, uh, the original ideas from Tolman. So out of this initial ligand conformer ensembles, we perform a conformer selection where uh, ligands are selected by steric extrema and we also sample out low XTB energy conformers. These hysteric ex extrema are quite important for catalysis. I unfortunately do not have the time to go through all of the uh, intricacies of these here, but we take a min and max size span of the ligands, basically how small or large the ligand can be within its own conformations. And we also take a few other uh, ideas out of this, including a Boltzmann conformer, a Boltzmann weighted conformer average, and conformers with the smallest buried volume. Those are all important for the representation of these um, of, 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 of ligands in catalytic systems. And uh, like I, I also would tell you many things that we did here uh, in terms of how we evaluated uh, these conformers to get at the final point. But I can little, uh, little to say we use DFT for many of the um, um, proper evaluation of the conformers. So we have the conformation on, on the conformer ensembles, the calculative crash and refining DFT. Uh, we get a total of 21,000 unique conformers with an average of 13.8 conformer per ligand. And well, now what do we do with this, right? We want to do something with it. Ideally, we get properties or descriptors for each of these ligands. And how can we go about this, right? Because we, in the end, we want to expand this vastly, vastly using machine learning models. So the same way that in Frozen, she sings, do you wanna build a snowman? I'm singing, do you wanna build a male models? And we go from these conformational ensembles, uh, which I said will be here, the 1558 ligands with their conformers um, to get those properties. Now, which properties are you going to get and how, right? So I'll tell you which. It's, a, it's actually a pretty simple uh, question to answer given all we know about the literature of these systems. You want something that will represent the electronic parameters of your ligand, the standard parameters of your ligand, and some features that describe the whole molecule. In this case here, we have 38 for the electronic, 28 for sterics, and 12 for whole molecule, a total of 78 uh, uh, properties evaluated for each conformer. So now we have the representative conformer ensembles I told you about with 78 properties for each conformer. And a few examples of them are in terms of electronics, we have uh, NBO orbitals and uh, molecular orbitals for quiff functions, some NMR tensors for phosphorus, uh, molecular electrostatic potentials, and many others. We have steric parameters in terms of classic sterimol and some uh, new this, uh, uh, features included here as well, and also volume and so on. And finally, we also have whole molecule parameters. Um, here I'm highlighting pint, uh, dispersion potential pint developed by Robert Polichia uh, as well. So now we know which. The question that remains is how? And without getting into too many details, I'll just tell you that this could be a lot of work. 
But luckily for a lot of the properties I'm telling you about today, you will be able to use a software that, that is developed by my great friend, Shell Yonner, called Morpheus, which is Molecular Features for Machine Learning, uh, stands for Molecular Features for Machine Learning. And long story short, uh, Morpheus allows for you to gather these properties very rapidly, and Morpheus will be available on uh, Shell Yonner's GitHub very soon, as soon as the preprint is out, which is very soon. So we have the properties. What can we do next? Or descriptors, I should say. Each ligand has a descriptor. Conformers have properties. I want to make that distinction. Well, we go and try to see how the, the, the space, the properties and descriptor space look like. And we can use many different techniques for this. Uh, for example, we can use principal component analysis and that can be interesting from our point of view of uh, seeing what contributes for each principal uh, component. Of course, this here doesn't tell you much, but as soon as I start to do some labeling, you'll see here that uh, many of my ligands have carbon, few carbon atoms directly connected to phosphorus and so on. And I can tell you that the principal component one, in terms of variance and main contributions about uh, volume and the, Principal component two is about uh, electronic properties. You can also review this in terms of uh, U maps. So if you want to see the space a little bit differently, you can also explore different approaches to how to define these spaces. I'm not going to go too much into it because I want to show you how this can be used uh, live. But the idea is that you can uh, organize these spaces in many different ways and techniques that would be interesting for your problems. And you finally get to a very cool problem, which is build and gather machine learning predictions so that we can go from 1558 to over 191 million ligands. How can we do this? Well, one might say, ah, throw a black box, machine learning black box on this and uh, let the, the rest work, right? But the question is, for real, if you want to do this correctly, is how do we achieve these arcane magics that go into these black boxes? And they are not. We, I'll tell you a lot about it, uh, but it's just an idea how we can get there, right? One idea is using something that was mainly developed by my great friend and collaborator here in this work, uh, Tobias Gensch, called the Bag of Substance Model where each phosphine ligand is basically defined by a matrix that you can have uh, this matrix being by the number of substrates that comes in and each descriptor <clears throat> will go through a uh, linear regression and they can basically be described as this uh, sum plus a constant, uh, this weighted sum plus a constant. Another way that you can do these machine learning models in terms of representations uh, is a fingerprint representation that you can think as a barcode for your molecule where you concatenate into a big vector and then can do many different uh, machine learning techniques with it. For example, you can start very simple with multiple linear regression, uh, but you can go more complex with random forests or even more complex with Gaussian processes, gradient boosting regression or kernel ridge regression. So there is a total of six models here, including um, plus bug substance. Uh, what gives is that you can also use a different representation, which is a graph representation for your molecules, where you go from a Lewis structure to a graph, which where each atom becomes a node in your graph and each bond becomes an edge in that graph. Now, I, I, I did this to say the graph convolution neural networks on molecules is an amazing uh, set of techniques and it really has shown tremendous success. For example, this work from Google Brain where they show that uh, machines can learn how to smell. Or if you look at the some of the seminal papers on convolutional neural nets on, on molecular graphs, like this one from the Oscuro Guzik and Gomez Bombarelli, um, Rafa Gomez Bombarelli now at MIT, in archive has over 1700 citations on this paper from uh, Google Brain used the newer message passing quantum chemistry with uh, also over 1,700 citations. And the whole idea here is that we can take these graph representations and 
use graph neural networks uh, to make uh, robust predictions. Let me show you some of the results for, for our uh, features that we had uh, in this work. We had 190 of them. And here I'm showing you the energy of reduction on the Boltzmann setting. Pretty great statistics, R squared on 95, mean absolute error of 0.01, very good. Okay, let's see another one. The uh, frontier rock orbital energy of the Lumo in this case on the boats, still excellent statistics. And I can go on. Let's take a look at Pint from Robert Polici in many different representations and also the Homo energy, uh, 94, 94, 82. Pretty good. Okay, let's go from electronics to sterics. With sterimol, we have 84 for sterimol B5, 73 for B1, and 72 for L. It's still good. They still can, still can do a lot of great work with it. Uh, Let's look at something else, like parameterization. Okay. Perhaps we can do something about it. Perhaps there's something to be done here or with blurry volume. Okay, let's keep going to see what else, what else the model, uh, how the model performs. And oh no, things start to get catastrophically bad. This is garbage on fire bad. Graph evolution neural network, you're supposed to be. The one is supposed to be balanced to this force, right? So you have great results like the reduction energy, and you have terrible results like this uh, bird volume on um, uh, these octaves. In the end, if you look at uh, uh, the performance of these machine learning models, in, uh, uh, each of the models that we use, uh, for example, here using a representative example like Vimy. Uh, you see that it performs well for this particular uh, 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 property, but each model has better performances for each of the properties and so on, which is just not good enough, right? You don't want you to have this, this sort of problem and bias in, in the model itself. So a solution that we found was to make models of Mars. And the idea here is very much like uh, the machine learning models decide to listen to the Beatles, uh, a little help from my friends, and they help each other uh, by the, posing the idea of using stacked regressors. That's how we achieve this. And what I, I'm going to show you, basically, for each of these models, on average, the contribution of each model type to all the meta models relies on about 21% for the GCNN and 20% for GBR. And you know our bag of substance is doing quite well uh, for uh, such a simple model. And when we look at the statistics of, of how this goes for all the 190 models here, first, you can see that uh, the mean absolute error is decreased when you include the, the, the meta models. And these are given in, in standard deviations. And finally, uh, you, the, the, the meta models have an average MME of 0.245. Very, very nice. Um, so going back to that question, where how do you go from uh, 1558 to 191 million ligands? The idea is that we would use these meta models to do so. Uh, however, uh, we want this to be used by the community right away. And unfortunately, deploying for 191 million is a bit challenging at the moment, but we can deploy for VL2, which is 300,000. And if you're not, Satisfied with 300,000 uh, points with 190 descriptors each, I, you know, talk to me because I'd love to know what you're trying to do with these things. So the, the, we go back to the idea of these graph convolution neural networks uh, and many other machine learning models to have uh, machine learning predictions. This all builds us to this little friend called Kraken. And Kraken is not just a massive uh, uh, Excel file with all of these properties or YAML files, uh, but it's also a web app. And you know, if you let me, I will do a live demo of Kraken right now. Let's hope that uh, you know uh, everything works well. So here I am in in in, uh, in the web browser, and I will zoom in a little bit. This is the UMAP representation. Uh, I can also have a, a PCA representation. And as you can see, as I hover the mouse, I can see all these ligands that we have, right? So I'm gonna click on a on a on a ligand like this guy, and we can 
you can see it, the ligand here. You can go to PubChem if you want to. Here are all the properties I told you about, 190 of them. You can peruse this. You can download a file of all of this data. You can see the conformers um, and uh, try to work out how this will uh, perform for your uh, particular problem. And if, you, if, if you're not satisfied with, the, with this amount of data, you can always uh, also show the machine learning data. And it starts to get uh, a, a more complete space, as you can see. But if this is not how you want to search for things, if, uh, say, you want to, I don't know, um, you want to draw the structure that, that you're interested in. And uh, let me show you how this looks like. Well, we have here X plus D2, but this is not what I want. I want something that has a cyclopen two group in it. Okay, so we'll just throw a cyclopen two group here, and done. Everything that we have that has a cyclopen two in it will show up. So you can go to this nice uh, big ligand with many, many, many conformers and play around with it. And there's more stuff that you can do with uh, with uh, the, the Kraken web app. So. Coming back to the talk, uh, the question that remains, what can you use this for, right? Well, let me tell you a story about two papers, very similar reactions. One came out in 2018 in science, one came out in Nature Communications in 2019. The 2018 one is by Mark uh, Bisco and show, oops, my technical problems. Technical problems. We have technical issues. Uh, I will just ignore. Uh, this is from Bisco and from Burke. Basically, they have a very similar reaction where you do a, a Suzuki coupling um, that is stereospecific, where you're coupling now CSP3 carbon atoms. Very cool. The question is can Kraken enable the uh, transfer learning of reaction outcomes, right? Like I said, you have. Uh, Two reaction, one reaction, two groups, two different ligand sets. The role here, the what we want to figure out here is the role of uh, organophosphorus three ligands on stair specific Suzuki couplings. Burke has a ligand motif where you we, they used electron poor ortho uh, methyl arrow or benzo arrow uh, phosphines with uh, 19 ligands total and up to 99 ES, whereas Bisco had 24 ligands total up to 98% ES, and they have no ligands that overlapped in the two, uh, in the two data sets, okay? And they did have different uh, design strategies for each of them. So if we try to train a, a few models on the work data, we find that we can uh, predict what would be great ligands from the BISCO data to be used uh, on the uh, Burke, the, uh, Burke reaction and vice versa. It's very interesting uh, that we can do this without having to do any experiments, basically just uh, approaching this uh, library that we have. Moreover, you can also try to do some interesting predictions based on the predicted selectivity. So now I showed you earlier those uh, PC plots and here, uh, Everything that's in gray, uh, these pixels, each pixel is a, is a phosphine ligand, uh, squares are visco data, work is uh, the triangles. And finally, we have two candidates, these ones that I'm showing you on the left, that could be used, uh, that would also be very well, uh, uh, very, would be very uh, uh, selective for these reactions, for both of those reactions. And what we can do, instead of doing this, uh, just search on the selectivity is do a search based on classification, which allows for you to navigate through this uh, chemical space, basically, uh, given the experimental selectivity that we had um, previously from the, ex the experimental work. So now we have what we call the selective machine learning virtual space of compounds where you can search for them and, uh, and see other candidates. Uh, we had many, many, many candidates that would be uh, very good, but I'm showing you just two in this space here. Um, finally, I want to say that uh, the database and the web app can be accessed through uh, this link, 
and the preprint is should be on Chem Archive uh, within the next hours to days. Uh, who knows when it will show up? But it's uh, you know just waiting for it. No, it's there. And uh, I want to say one last thing, uh, which is I think it's high time for chemistry and chemical engineering to take a, a page from the information revolution. Uh, I was reading this uh, pretty cool opinion from uh, the writer Walter Isaacson. Yeah, he was part of the, tri the uh, trial for the Pfizer vaccine, COVID-19 vaccine. And he says, it's not, it is another wondrous miracle from a biotech revolution in which knowledge of generic coding will become as important as digital coding and molecules will become the new microchips. And this is a lesson for us, chemists, chemical engineers, and molecular scientists to truly embrace the idea of the information revolution and take control using big data and computational techniques for this. I really see a future full of possibilities ahead for, for us. Um, I'm so happy to yet uh, say again that uh, I will be joining Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon University in January 2022. Uh, the Gomes Group at CMU, we are chemical designers, engineers, and data scientists. We're going to be split between chemistry and chemical engineering. And we are going to explore uh, the idea of catal catalysis and reaction design for organic materials using AI, computer science, automated flow synthesis, and physical organic chemistry. I would love to thank again all the amazing people that I worked with on this project. Uh, the Sigma group, the Spur Guzzi group, my, all of them are, are superb amazing people that I just had the best time working with. And I would like to thank Alan and the Meta Lab team. Uh, Alan is a terrific uh, supervisor and I just loved my time here. I'm still loving my time here in Toronto. Um, I also would like to thank Bunt, uh, NSERC for the Bunting Fellowship uh, here in Canada. Um, all these other funding agencies, the Vector Institute, of course, and um, you all for listening. Thank you. I would love to answer any questions you might have. Okay, thank you, Gabrielle, for this wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Um, we will be now uh, taking questions from uh, uh, the chat or from the YouTube. Um, um, if uh, somebody can uh, make them available to me. Uh, Cassia Turci, congratulations you. And Christian Mercado also, uh, congratulations on your talk. Um, Thank so you. We're now, we're now uh, waiting for questions. We're open for questions. I think Carlos Borca. Has his hand raised? Um, okay, so he can talk if he wants to. Go ahead, Carlos. Hey, Gabe, how are you doing? Good. How are you, man? Uh, great. Thanks for the for the talk. I think it's uh, pretty amazing what you're doing. Um, I got a question for you. I thought it was really interesting the way that you are incorporating QM information into your models. Uh, but I was wondering if you could explain a little bit more on how you actually interface all of this information together. Because it's normally, like uh, I'm used to looking at models that so you use some sort of featureization strategy, but then it's not clear to me how that meets the QM information on top of it to basically provide the whole description of, of the molecule. As you said, molecules are QM three-dimensional objects, right? So. Uh, if you could expand a little bit more on that, would be great. Yeah, so uh, perhaps I, I I didn't make it very clear. Um, it's a little bit different because what we do is not one model that uh, predicts all the properties, uh, but rather we have one model for each of the properties. Um, so in that way, uh, it's 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 not directly. Um, saying we do have the QM properties embedded in these um, models per se. But I, I get your point, of course. And I must say, we do have uh, all the projects that I didn't talk about today. And you know, 
obviously, uh, where we do embed more QM information each in, within the model to do different predictions. Um, just so you know, this is a major difference on how we went about this here. But I, I see it, um, it's an excellent question. It's just um, it, perhaps I, sh I should have made that a little bit more clear. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, do we have any more questions? I don't know if, uh, if Alvaro and uh, Jessica have the questions in YouTube. I, I don't have access to the YouTube channel. Uh, JP here also has his hand raised. All right, uh, so just go ahead, please. Hello, Gabe. That was a great talk. Uh, congratulations, and congratulations on your new uh, assignment in, in uh, parenting development. I was wondering if you uh, use any of these techniques for drug discovery, uh, where I'm currently working with a group at uh, UNAM, who, who were using um, AI algorithms to optimize and to do what they, it's called hit expansion, when you have a, a hit, a, a molecule structure that sort of works, but you want to optimize it, and mm -hmm. you want to find new, new uh, molecules that have the same properties. And we've been working with the, the basically the grammar of the smiles to try mm -hmm. to generate uh, to generate this chemical space, which we'll then use to uh, any number of algorithms like AI to uh, get the properties we want. Have you any experience in, in this kind of uh, work? Um, I, I personally do not work on, on um, that uh, at the moment. However, many of my colleagues do here in the, uh, in the meta lab. And mm -hmm. uh, I would suggest you to look into the selfies representation uh, for these problems, which is developed by the Asperger's group and makes uh, these types of uh, Grammar modifications on, on molecular systems much more robust. In fact, uh, every 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 selfie string is a valid one, which is would make your uh, problem much uh, much more feasible and, and, and easy to solve. It's, it also uh, renders itself uh, a lot better for generative models. And uh, and in, in in the papers on on uh, <clears throat> on that sense, you can on on that you can see that as well. Now. While, this, uh, while we were not working directly, uh, or say it was not specifically for drug discovery, uh, we have a paper that came out in chemical science last week uh, on the stoned algorithm, which is a new idea on how you can uh, have generative models that are gradient free, uh, gradient free, but basically there's no training involved. You can uh, build chemical paths between uh, molecules that you would train on that, not train, but like try to figure out the joint similarity uh, on uh, things that you might be interested in for those structures. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I highly recommend you to check one, that one as well. They'll also use uh, selfies as the representation for making those modifications. And you can think about in terms of uh, um, genetic algorithms that's also being done by the group mm -hmm. here uh, to figure out how to expand chemical space of uh, drug like molecules. Thank you. Thank you for the pointers and congratulations. Thank you. Welcome. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So um, do we have any more questions for Gabriel? Joaquin Barroso has a has his uh, hand and also I do I can't see who has the rice the, the hand raised. So just go ahead Joaquin please and then after Thank that uh, we'll yeah. see Gabe, congratulations, a wonderful and very inspiring talk. Uh, this, this change of, uh, of point of view in, in going about chemistry, well, it supposes that, right? A, a huge uh, shift in, in how we think about uh, synthesis, but it's also going to suppose a, a very strong change in how we go about teaching chemistry, the, the way yes. of, from properties to structure and not the other way around. Uh, so the first part of my question is, what do you think about that now that you're going into becoming a professor? Ah, that's amazing. I, I love that question because uh, when you think about how we teach organic chemistry, right? Uh, we really have to change that. 
And this is something that I, I've been um, talking uh, a lot about with uh, Joshua Schreier from Fortune, for example, and um, thinking about this also with uh, uh, John Kitchen, at, at, uh, my future colleague at uh, Carnegie Mellon Chemical Engineering. How can we teach chemists to think more in terms of properties and so on? Um, I, I do have plans on, on how we can teach organic chemistry from a more discovery uh, uh, point of view rather than, well, honestly, I don't want to have memorization anymore. I don't memorize things. I don't expect people to memorize things. Um, so that's one point. And of course, a lot of this comes from having a fundamental uh, understanding of physical chemistry and physical organic chemistry. Those should be uh, put out first for students, in my opinion, uh, before you go into, is this an algal or what? Um, um, that's, that's one point. Uh, but indeed, I, I, I also would like to make the point that um, Alan and many others uh, have been pushing for the idea of the, this acceleration consortium that started here in Canada very recently, where they will have master's programs uh, for teaching people how to work uh, on an automated chemistry environment. And also uh, Carnegie Mellon has a, a whole idea on, on and a master's in um, data uh, analysis for uh, automated science and so on. So there's a convergence in many of these universities and, and many of us trying to push for it on how we are going to have a future uh, where folks think about chemistry, not from you know, a molecule per molecule basis, but a much more property uh, basis in like first. Excellent question. Thank you. Uh, if I may, uh, a second and technical question. I mean, this is a, a topic that we could go on forever, right? The, 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 the changing chemistry teaching. So, but uh, the technical aspect of my question, can we use Kraken to find uh, molecules through similar uh, similarity criterion? Do you mean structure? Oh, like structure, see. yes, in, in structure similarity. Yeah, similarity. That, that is a... Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, that, that, that should be... Uh, uh, that, that should be relatively trivial, uh, yeah. Uh, you can think about how you prioritize and do the searches. Uh, you could use a stone for it. Uh, there, there are many, many different uh, ways that you could try to do that. Uh, we try to think more in terms of properties because we want to do inverse design of these things. And when it comes to inverse design, they don't necessarily have this similar properties, right? So if you think about buckle ligands, can we find buckle ligand or buckle like, sorry, ligands that perform like bulk of ligands bar are not the same structures. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Congratulations again. Thanks, Joaquin. Okay. Thank you, Joaquin. I see that Carlos still has his hand raised. Uh, does he want to speak again or does anyone want to speak? I could speak again, I have no problem. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead. Um, no, just uh, a follow-up question uh, with regard to the, to the previous um, discussion. Um, <clears throat> so how do, you, how do you deal with um, this flexibility of the molecules when you're producing the properties in terms of going back from the properties to, uh, to the structures, right? Because flexibility implies that, uh, you know, if you, if you want to aim for a particular property, then it might be tricky to go, go back using the, the inverse setup. Yeah, wow, that is a, that's such a good question. So um, the molecules have, well, rather, let me, let me try to put it this way. When we train the, 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 the models, um, we have 78 properties, if you remember, uh, for each coffiner. But when it comes to the ligand, we have a total of 190 descriptors because uh, a descriptor is for the ligand. And th those descriptors will be based on uh, the different ways we encode uh, molecular flexibility into these models. That can be with the Boltzmann 
way that can be with uh, the min uh, minimum in terms of B5 of the steric size of that ligand or max or delta and so on. So for a particular uh, problem that you're trying to do a regression, um, each of these will be done differently. So you're gonna have a model for your Boltzmann weight, you're gonna have a model for your mean, you're gonna have a model for your max, et cetera. And you can mix those things uh, depending on the problem you have. But when you go back uh, to try to go from, you know, from uh, the property to the ligand, of course, you're going to find yourself in that conundrum. Luckily, um, because catalysis tends to be such a, uh, a complicated environment where your molecule may explore many different uh, conformational profiles throughout one reaction, and I'll tell you, um, this is yet another thing that's coming very soon. Uh, a work, a beautiful work done by uh, the Sigma group and the Doyle group at Princeton, um, where they use crack in the Kraken uh, data set for figuring that out. So um, I don't want to spoil, but uh, the folks already have not only thought about this, but used uh, to optimize ligands and, and catalysts. Uh, okay, um, I think we're running out of time, but we have two questions from YouTube. So if you could uh, answer them quickly, please, I, I, I will be grateful. So there is a question from um, Organo Metallica, which asks if you intend to extend cracking beyond post beams. And the second question, a second question from Pierre Steves, uh, who asks how to make these descriptors for crystals, periodic. Um, thank you. Yeah. So. Um, First, the question from uh, Dr. Organometallica, uh, Dr. Brandon. Um, yes, we, we, we will expand Kraken beyond the uh, one of the date phosphines. Um, I can't tell you just yet where this is all going, but yes, uh, it will be expanded um, to other chemical entities, especially now that we have the know-how on, on how to, to do this. Uh, and answering to the question from Pierre, um, it, it, Pierre asked, like, how, how to make these descriptors for crystals? Actually, folks have thought about this, uh, and um, the, there are many groups doing amazing things in terms of uh, uh, crystals and heterogeneous uh, catalysis, for example. Uh, I highly recommend the work from uh, Zachary Galisi at Carnegie Mellon Chemical Engineering. And... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, also, you can see uh, the uh, SOAP, for example, representation. There are many, many uh, amazing groups doing uh, work on the field and developing uh, uh, descriptors for, for crystals and uh, periodic structures. Okay, one last question, uh, Gabriel. We have Kuzien um, Sauceda has raised his hand. So please go ahead. I had a uh, quickly very nice uh, talk. And just can you comment quickly, uh, like, as, as you want uh, the the um, regarding the extra uh, sometimes in in this kind of methods you can go in these extrapolation regimes can you validate somehow how robust are your some of your predictions or do you have some measures or, so or uh perhaps perhaps uh, it wasn't very clear but when we did the the meta models we had split our our set into uh, uh train test validate and of course uh the idea also here is to be able to test these on experimental sites. Um, that's something we showed, we showcased with the comparison between the BISCO and the Burke work. Um, but there are many other works that we have been doing, uh, both in, in uh, all teams involved that use this uh, in experimental uh, settings where we can validate the problems. The, the, you know the properties we try to predict for the models are they are built for them. Uh, does that does that answer your question? I just want to say one thing I forgot. If you are interest, if any of this interests you, uh, and you'd like to work with a new professor, uh, please reach out. Uh, Carnegie Mellon, you can apply for a PhD in chemistry or chemical engineering uh, to work with my team. I'll also be looking for postdocs and. Uh, undergraduates uh, from CMU always be very welcome in, in my group. I uh, want you have a very um, a very diverse and and, uh, and uh, uh, you know 
smart group. Uh, and I would love to have lots of folks from Latin America uh, joining us and, and uh, try to push how we do catholicism in chemistry for uh, the future. Um, so I just want you to point that out. Okay, yeah. So thank you very much, Gabriel. This was very illuminating. Thank you very much. On behalf of the organizing committee, we thank you again and thank you all for your, uh, your attendance. Thank you very much and be good. Thank you.